Originally, there was a second driving section between the chopper battle and the auto gun trenches. The pacing felt wrong, so we decided to remove it and connect the end pieces so that the train yard opens directly into the garage. Playtesters often failed to recognize that they could scramble through windows while they were avoiding being shot by the auto gun. We added this window exit and forced players to use it so that they would learn to rely on windows to get around. Some playtesters didn't realize that they would need to climb over trucks to navigate around the auto gun emplacement. So we added this truck jump early in the level as a form of introductory training. In order to train players that crouching through the trenches is critical for survival, we did several things. First, we start the player in the safe position by forcing them to crouch under the fence to enter the area. Once inside, they learn by watching the zombies. Upright zombies are gunned down, but their torsos are free to roam in the shadow of the junk. Some playtesters believe that while the guns were busy shooting zombies, they would be able to move freely. To counteract this impression, we increased the number of guns from one to three, making it clear that there was always going to be a gun free to shoot the player. Zombies serve the double purpose of horror and humor. Here, since we knew where the player's view would be, we added a comical scene of a fast zombie torso running away from a soldier. The original design for this sequence involved shutting down the cannon by flipping a switch. That was neither obvious nor rewarding. We decided to let the player blow it up instead, which gave us another opportunity to use our cinematic physics. Once we added the onboard radar to the Strider battle at the end of the episode, we needed to train the player in its use well before they reached that area. On, this garage was already in the game as a place where Alex needed to stay while the player went alone through the autocannon area. It was a perfect fit to have the mechanic rebels add their radar to the car while Gordon was busy somewhere else. There's a lot of energy that goes into shaping Alex and um, making sure she stays on the right path or stays true to the vision that I think we have for her. You know, I want Alex to be liked. I know everybody at Valve wants Alex to be liked. Um, but what is really great is that if I get off course or if I've been in the booth too long and, and I'm starting to and I'm starting to sound a little naggy, then I have I have somebody who's there to kind of pull me back and say, hey, why don't you try it this way? Or or um, I think you're veering off course and starting to sound like <laughs> like somebody's mother or something, you know, because I'm there to to help if if you're lost, you know, the get goings or stuff like that to um, to help keep the game moving and keep you on track and you know there's a kind of a fine line you don't want somebody constantly bothering you but you also want a friendly companion you know you want somebody to help you out once in a while so trying to not go one way or the other was was a bit of a trick for us strong attention to visual design in this room make this unconventional puzzle both intuitive and rewarding to begin with the room is sparse with a reward clearly visible, but locked up in the cage. A strange centerpiece draws the player's attention, and the visible switch is obviously a part of the solution. The health charger next to the switch hints that the solution involves getting onto the catwalk rather than activating the switch from the ground. The van entrance discourages players from bringing in objects they might use to solve the puzzle by stacking. The lone grenade crate is a strong suggestion that grenades figure in the solution. And finally, the corpse in the rafters and the scorch marks on the ground, and the story they tell, provide the most important clue. So the circumstances around creating Alex were so kismet that it's almost a little scary. I mean, if you think of the ideal super self that you want to be, like, um, I don't know, badass moves and being able to karate chop everybody, and then add on to that having a writer to make you sound witty at every turn, <laughs> it's like having an uber self for me. So I immediately fell in love with Alex. The approach to the White Forest Inn contains a number of elements that set the scene for the coming ambush. The road is blocked by combine walls. A soldier spots you in the distance and radios you in, and two hunters run across an opening on the far side of a fence. All these clues are there for the attentive player to spot directly or to create a sense of growing apprehension in the player who might be paying slightly less attention to the details. So in each episode, we start by agreeing on how to use color choices to create and reinforce the right thematic tone. 
The tint of a scene can be a powerful source of mood. Episode 1 was pervaded by deep reds. For episode 2, we made heavy use of blue tints in the outdoor areas. The blue was meant to set an ominous tone, while the warm splashes of sunlight were intended to offer visual contrast that suggests the glimmer of hope. Now, a question I get asked a lot is, what is the big difference between um, acting for a stage and film and then acting for a video game? Because this is the first time I've ever done a video game. Um, in general, in acting, it's helpful to have a director's clear vision from which to spring. Um, then the actor can run with the idea, play with it, imagine new things, fill it out, and you know make it a tangible thing or a tangible character. And the great thing about video game acting for me is that I'm completely unlimited. I'm not bound by what I can do physically or how I look or what kind of environment that can be physically created. So the possibilities are completely limitless. There are no boundaries with this. So when we get together and we talk about what the scene is, when they set the stage for me and what environment I'm going to be in, I... I immediately get a complete high, and I, I can only imagine that it is something like how somebody gets when they actually see the game, because it blows my mind, the pictures that they paint um, about, you know, where we are, what situations we're in. So we, we discuss that a little, and then from there, it just kind of go on, uh, I guess, instinct is the only way I can really describe it, because I just take what they give for me and, and kind of volley it back in, in the way that it comes out immediately. So I just go into my little dark booth, and I can imagine that I'm anywhere. And it's the best, the best kind of make-believe for a storyteller. When you, you just aren't limited. One issue with a number of our encounters with the Combine is they don't live long enough for players to experience some of their more interesting AI. Some unique elements introduced here with respect to the Combine are branching assaults, so the soldiers introduced to the field don't take up predictable positions. Flexible assault points, so that soldiers can stray from designer-specified locations to establish line of fire or cover. Assault progression, a feedback system so that soldier advances respond to player actions and skill rather than timing. Giving soldiers different tactical roles. For instance, squads in the field distract the player, allowing other soldiers to execute surprise moves not present in our typical frontal assault scenarios. The net effect of these changes is that the soldiers appear to have awareness of the layout of the building that you're trapped in, and a strategy well, for flushing you out. Supply. To complement the Hunter's aggressive AI, the White Forest Inn was designed with a non-linear floor plan. There are multiple ways in and out of each room, as well as alternate routes to the basement and to the second floor. As the player moves through the inn, the Hunters often select a shorter route and surprise the player by arriving first or by heading them off altogether. The last Hunters that enter the building destroy two of the doors that have trapped Alex and the player inside. Removing these obstacles opens the entire outdoor arena for combat, allowing the player to choose whether to fight the hunters within the building or take them on outside. The inn's design is a crafted experience that is controlled but not linear. The encounter is intended to create a heightened sense of danger without actually being particularly dangerous. The idea is to create opportunities for some memorable unscripted combat moments by keeping the player a bit on their heels. Normally, Alex is out of frame during combat and soldiers don't survive very long. By encouraging the player to move back from the windows, the map creates space for Alex and the soldiers to exhibit interesting behaviors that reinforce the mood of the siege. Sometimes, even in an action game, it can be hard to convince players to act like an action movie hero. Here we wanted the player to make a 150 foot turbo jump off the edge of the road and crash into boxes at the bottom. Instead, wary playtesters routinely took the safe way down. To encourage more recklessly heroic behavior, we disguised the easy path and added obvious ramps to clearly communicate this was a legitimate feature of the level. As I'm, I'm sure uh, a lot of people know, I, I perform on Broadway, and sometimes people will show up at the stage door with Alex Vance posters to sign or, or just an encouraging word about the game and just, oh my gosh, I saw in the playbill that you, you played Alex Vance and, oh, it, it gets me so hyped when people come up to me and are, and are excited about the game because I don't get that immediate feedback that I get on stage every night. So when somebody tells me that they liked it face to face, it's really, really exciting to me. But um, so I, I guess a couple of people have t taken pictures with me at the stage door. 
And I went through a phase where I wanted to know what people thought of the game. So I was looking on like message boards and, and checking out what the chat was. And I found this thread that had a picture of me with somebody at the stage door. <laughs> and uh, they're talking about, look, this is me with Alex Vance. And the first response was, she is so ugly. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was cute. <laughs> In the Source Engine, we use a realistic radiosity lighting simulator to generate lighting detail for the geometry in our game worlds. In previous games using the Source Engine, shadows were simulated as if cast by totally opaque objects. In Episode 2, we needed to render large wooded areas which required us to modify our shadowing technology to account for the sparse, semi-transparent nature of foliage. With these upgrades to our radiosity lighting simulator, we are now able to realistically illuminate the trees themselves, as well as generate soft, semi-transparent shadows on the environment around them. Our main goal with this scene was to create a cinematic battle of the titans, Dog versus a Strider. While we were excited with the earlier implementations, it became obvious that players were uncertain of their role in the scene. Originally, the confrontation built slowly with Dog squaring off against the Strider, but having such a slow beginning proved problematic. It looked great in the trailer, but didn't play well in the game. Instead of the slow build, we decided to send Dog straight into action. He makes a grand entrance, jumps on the Strider, and the fight is on. The quick start helps to grab the player's attention instead of giving them too much time to worry about what they ought to be doing. The Strider has big parts of him that rip off. He spews goo everywhere. He's a great test bed for new modeling technology and our new particle system. We custom built him just for this sequence. With our episodic process, a lot of new technology comes online throughout development. Since any new technology takes a year or more to really work out all the bugs, we like to look for isolated areas, like this one, where we can test out new things without risking all the things we know already work. We did this with HDR in our Lost Coast demos. Once we're sure we didn't break anything, we can move the features back into general use. Since the Strider worked out really well here, he'll be the new Strider as we move forward, and we'll be applying what we've learned to any new monsters in Episode 3. Alex's robot dog is cobbled together from spare parts all of which are in various states of disrepair. For episode two, we chose to use shading techniques to improve the look of Dog and better convey his scrapyard origins. Along with upgrades to Dog's texture maps, his shader now uses a combination of fong shading and environment mapping to increase the apparent detail and diversity of materials, from rusty bolts to the damaged metal flaps salvaged from a combine scanner. Racing Dog to the base was not a preconceived plan. It was born out of testing the level over and over, and repeatedly trying to keep up with Dog as he ran to the base. This was sufficiently fun for us that we began to figure out ways to encourage players to do it too. Well, Gordon, so, a really cool experience was that Safe at last. while I was at Valve, I was talking to one of the animators in the hallway, and, um, and we were just carrying on a conversation. I was getting to know what he did, and and I just happened to be looking over my shoulder and noticed that people kept popping their heads out of their offices. And um, one of the other guys noted to me that these people, <laughs> whoo, bless them, they have to sit around and listen to my voice all day long. So for for that voice to be kind of just chatting in the hallway was a little weird. And I guess I kind of liken that I can understand it because the very first time I saw my voice on Alex Vance's face, it was so bizarre. And so when I watch people talk to me for the first time and they've heard my voice as Alex, they have the exact same expression. I'm like, I, I understand. I get it.